Hi guys, welcome to section one in the fundamentals of drawing. In this section we'll be focusing solely on proportion and creating the groundwork for later drawings. Proportion is the underlying scaffolding of a drawing and is the force that holds your work together. Think of proportions as the foundations of a building, as once they are set they cannot easily be changed or adjusted without any significant work. When talking about proportion in relation to the practicalities of drawing, we are almost always referring to the height of something against its width. This is because drawing, by its fundamental nature, is two-dimensional, meaning there are horizontals and verticals. This is very important to remember, because while the final illusion of a fully rendered work is three-dimensional, we are, of course, restricted to just two dimensions meaning any point can be seen as relatively higher, lower, further to the left or further to the right than another point, regardless of subject matter. Using this lithograph from the Charles Barg and Leon Jerome drawing course of the Belvedere torso as an example, we can see by using the horizontals and verticals to find points on the drawing, we build up an accurate representation of the silhouette. Now it is easy to find these points if you are simply tracing the image at a manageable size. But of course if you were to draw the live standing figure, for example, it is practically impossible to roll out a life-size piece of tracing paper and mark the dots, although attempts have been made to achieve similar results. There have been numerous approaches throughout history on how to transfer the theory of proportion to the practical application. Here we're going to talk about the main three techniques along with their pros and cons and the reason why Draw at Home chooses one particular one above all. Gridding is arguably the most common method for beginners to use and has its roots as far back as ancient Egypt. You can see how the Egyptians used grids on their paintings and frescoes allowing them to accurately create figures with the same proportion throughout. While this can be seen as an early form of proportional tool, it isn't strictly speaking a way of translating the visible world onto paper or canvas. One of the earliest recordings of a gridding system came in 1435 in Leon Alberti's Treaty della Pictura, or On Painting. While it is also known for its groundbreaking ideas on perspective, Alberti also talks about using a system of grids to help with the task of abstracting the three-dimensional down to a two-dimensional surface. In the treaty, he mentions a thin veil finely woven with larger threads marking out as many parallels as you prefer. This clearly describes a grid system, which would be placed in front of the object or scene you wish to depict. Of course, large-scale perspex or glass was not invented at this time, and so thinly woven material was used as a substitute. He goes on to say, the veil will help you greatly in learning to paint when you see round objects and objects in relief through it. Here we have a clear relation to the fact that by using a grid system, the artist can reduce the subject matter from the three-dimensional down onto the two-dimensional surface, allowing them to accurately recreate what they're seeing. He also gives advice for how the artist can proceed to develop their abilities by only indicating the edges of the object. This is likely referring to the top, bottom, left and right or the envelope of the form. When a painter wishes to test his skill without the veil, let him first mark the edges of the object within the veil's parallel lines. Although most notably, he also says the artist could remove the physical veil completely and begin to use just their eyes to find the relative perpendicular, or in other words, where the height meets the width. Or he may study them differently in imagining a line intersected by its perpendicular wherever these limits fall. It was Leonardo da Vinci who probably after learning about Alberti's theory during his apprenticeship in Florence, sketched out a design for what he called the perspectograph published in his Kodak Atlanticus in 1478. This design, as seen in a modern reconstruction, uses the same underlying principle as Alberti's veil. 
The grids were created most likely with thread in a frame, in front of which a piece of glass was placed. The artist would then sit behind a viewfinder set at a constant distance and height away from the glass. The user could then draw onto the glass the shapes they see in front of it, which could be then later transferred onto paper or canvas. To draw accurately any particular spot, take a glass as large as your paper, fasten it well between your eye and the object you mean to draw, and fix your head in a frame in such a manner as to not to be able to move it at a distance of two feet from the glass. Shut one eye and draw with a pencil accurately upon the glass all that you see through it. The idea of having a constant viewpoint where the artist returns is a vitally important one and it has become a canon in the theories and techniques of realist art schools today. It is especially useful for beginners or those who are drawing from life at any particular amount of time. This is because any change of position when measuring will cause differences and create wrongly proportioned drawings. It was Albert Dürer who developed many different drawing tools and aids which he published in his treaty, The Guide to Measurement with the help of ruler and compass in 1525. One of the earliest examples can be seen here in this sketch and engraving dated 1514 and it's almost an exact replica of da Vinci's drawing tool. Using the same concept of drawing onto a piece of glass in front of the model or scene. This other device by Jura uses a separate piece of paper with the same corresponding grids on as the frame, removing the need for the artist to draw onto glass and instead onto paper. This is very similar to the gridding methods used today. Jura did go on to create many different drawing tools, but all with the same underlying principles of a transparent two-dimensional plane perpendicular to the subject matter allowing the artist or user to accurately describe three-dimensional shapes on a two-dimensional surface. Throughout history, artists have developed and documented new drawing tools, from Robert Flood's sighting grid of 1617 to Jean Dubourget's perspective grid in 1710. Prominent artistic thinkers were known for publishing new papers on the matter of drawing aids, including Abraham Bose, a French academician and printmaker who in 1665 published the Treaty on Geometric Practices and Perspectives taught in the Royal Academy of Sculpture and Painting. We can see here in this etching attributed to him how a portrait artist would use a grid system to aid him in his work. Even relatively modern artists such as John Constable used a method of tracing directly onto glass which can be seen here in the sketch for Flatford Mill. As it's reported, Constable would place a piece of glass on the top of his easel, then using string attached to the four corners which were held in his mouth to bring the centre of the glass perpendicular to his eyes. He would then make a tracing of the image he saw using brush and ink, which could then be later transferred onto paper. It can be seen in the sketch that Constable used a gridding system to transfer the sketch onto the final canvas, which was well over 1 metre by 1.2 metres. This and other paintings like it were dubbed Constable's Six Footers, in reference to the size of the canvas. Although it is worth noting that Constable only placed the big elements of the composition. As much of these paintings were executed in the field and not in a studio, it is likely that Constable used this method as an approach to quickly find the composition, allowing him to use the limited time in the field painting rather than trying to find an accurate underdrawing. Even Impressionist artists like Van Gogh used a grid of sorts, which can be seen here in a modern replica. Although it can be argued this was much more of a helping hand in placement rather than a gridding system. Much like how Constable used tracing through glass, to help him with his large-scale outdoor paintings. 20th century artist Antonio Mancini used a variation on the grid, which he called his gratiola. And you can see it in use by Mancini in these photographs. Fellow painter and friend Walter Sickert gave an insight into his working practice. His paintings were done through a wire grill, whose squares correspond with a grill before the sitter. An interesting point here is how the 
grid isn't standardised like those used throughout history, for example in Albert Dürer's drawing tools. These various lines probably represented places and angles of interest, but as long as both of the viewing grids used were the same, then any grid system can be utilised. You can even see some of the string marks left on Mancini's final canvases. Although Mancini's approach to the grid system was unique, he would always work at two spots. One at a distance from the painting and sitter, and one at a spot next to the canvas. This allowed him to refer back to exactly the same points through the grid. Grids are also mentioned in arguably the most complete and famous drawing guide from the 20th century, Harold Speed's The Practice and Science of Drawing. Although Harold Speed here uses grids as a stepping stone, in order for students to understand the translation that takes place between the three-dimensional world, the viewer's eye, and the two-dimensional piece of paper or canvas, and in turn for the students to gain a vital understanding of what is meant by checking their horizontals and verticals. Speed gives instruction to hold the grid perpendicular and to avoid any tilt, which will cause the measurements to become inaccurate. This frame should be held between the eye and the object to be drawn, one eye being closed in a perfectly vertical position. Using a modern version of Harold Speed's handheld grid, we can see how it can be practically implemented. Firstly, a corresponding grid has to be drawn onto the drawing surface. It is vital that this grid is proportionally the same as the viewing grid being used. It is also vital that the grid be held at the same distance throughout the drawing, as any movement in the grid's position will render the measurements unusable. It is best to hold your arm locked in front of you to provide a fixed position. Moving the grid closer and further away from your eye will change the size of the subject matter relative to the grid, and as such the size of the final drawing. As Speed correctly states, any adjustment in the tilt of the grid will result in inaccurate marks. After experimenting with the size of the subject through the grid, I have used horizontals that line up with the top and bottom of the skull, as this will allow me to quickly line up the subject when using the grid throughout the drawing. The next step is to select an easy internal reference point to refer back to during the drawing. Here I am using where the jaw meets the zygomatic bone, as this gives me a vertical to use in order to find the back of the jaw and refer back to easily throughout the drawing. The next step is to mark the extremes of the subject on the grid marked on the paper. And then stepping back to the same spot, Check this placement through the grid, closing the same eye every time to ensure the drawing stays correct. It is now a case of adjusting the marks if needed and carefully plotting out the extremes of the subject. Once the extremes of the subject is mapped in, then the big proportions can be found. Holding a grid, even a small one for any length of time, will start to fatigue your arm and in the process making the act of measuring accurately almost impossible, and so a solution, much like Dürer's drawing tool, where the user isn't holding the grid can be used, as well as stopping your arm from fatiguing, because the viewing grid is at a set position throughout the process, the same reference points can be found easily, although of course you will have to stand at the same spot throughout the process. While gridding seems like the answer to all the students' needs, especially as today as it can be done in any number of websites or apps, 
it does have a major drawback. Namely, it doesn't teach the students to see visually and in turn learn to draw. Instead, it teaches them to copy in a piecemeal fashion. When referring to piecemeal, it is meant by drawing in isolation, often section by section or square by square, independent of the whole scene, often starting at one side of the object, working all the way around to get back to the same point without any understanding of the objects they have just drawn or the relationship to the whole or the whole scene. This gridding system plays into the human's natural tendencies to focus on detail. This means the student won't develop the ability to find the relationship between the three-dimensional world and the two-dimensional depiction, and as such should not really be used as a serious learning tool. Gridding, however, is a great tool to use for transferring work or scaling work up or down.